Welcome to the session on artificial intelligence and robotics uh, today and tomorrow. I am Barbara Caputo. I'm professor at Politecnico di Torino. I am a co-founder and member of ELLIS, the European Lab on Learning and Intelligence Systems. And uh, uh, today we will talk of the increasing investments uh, uh, in Europe about artificial intelligence, uh, how this ties uh, very closely with robotics and big data and calls for close collaborations uh, with public and private actors. Uh, to support that uh, and to have a real impact on the global scale, the European Commission is launching a new program, a private-public partnership, uh, and we will talk uh, on uh, uh, about this uh, today with my fellow panelists. So, we will have here with me uh, Lubna Bunakfa, founder and CEO of Okra Technologies, member of the EU high-level expert group on artificial intelligence. Laure Lebars, research project director at SAP, former president of the Big Data Value Association, now vice president uh, and project manager of the coordinated support action for the Big Data Value PPP. Anna Maria Stanku, CEO of Bucharest Robots uh, and board member of EU Robotics. And uh, Stefano Stramigioli, Professor for Advanced Robotics at University of Trente, Vice President Research of EU Robotics, uh, that represents the private part of the PPP Spark, uh, a major initiative uh, uh, in robotics and for civil robotics uh, in Europe. So, Laura, um, you have been uh, a main actor in the PPP on Big Data Value. Uh, can you tell us more about it? Thank you, Baba. So, first, artificial intelligence, data and robotics are really the core drivers for innovation, productivity and economic growth. And Europe has a vision, uh, leading the world in human-centric and trustworthy AI and data and robotics, all this compatible with European values and rights. So this new partnership will establish an open, collaborative and inclusive hub for those technologies with partners for, uh, from industry, including large SMEs and startups, uh, partners from research and academic, also regulators, investors, national and local governments, any communities and users uh, that may have interest and representative from uh, the civil society. And of course, we will collaborate cooperate with the European Commission. The, the, the vision of the partnership, and here I quote, is to boost European competitiveness, societal well-being and environmental aspect, to lead the world in researching, developing and deploying those value-driven, trustworthy AI, data and robotics all this based on European fundamental rights, principles and values. So, in other words, this partnership will boost new markets, applications, will attract public and private investment, will create a, a, a technical, economic and societal values for, for businesses, for citizens and environment, uh, will support research, uh, deployment and, and, uh, and development, foster novel application, and of course, uh, um, drive this innovation acceptance and uptake of those new technologies. Uh, of course, European sovereignty is expected in uh, this uh, deployment of trustworthy, safe and robust AI data and robotics. Uh, again, all this compatible with EU values and regulation. And last but not least, we will bridge, build bridges uh, between different st uh, stakeholders to, to enable this human-centric and trustworthy European vision. So uh, the objectives, in summary, the objectives of the partnership are really to establish this European leadership in AI, data and robotics technologies w with a high uh, socio-economic impact. Thank you. Um, this new PPP will be rooted strongly in previous experiences and it will uh, import best practices uh, and lessons learned. Um, a really a big case of success has been Spark, uh, the PPP on robotics. Uh, Stefano, can you tell us more about that? Yes, uh, absolutely. First, I want just to, to share with you my vision about the PPP, and then I can uh, conclude with con uh, answering your question. And I would like to start the presentation if possible. So, 
So, uh, yes, uh, um, also nature has inspired the research from, from the times of the old times of the Greek. Next slide, please. And of course, uh, human, uh, humans and the brain and artificial intelligence is, is the most complex machine in nature that there is. Next, please. And if we scale the human being uh, on the basis of how much brain it is used, you see that this picture, which is called the cortical of mucinus, that shows that there's very big hands. And that's why humans are much above intelligence to other animals, because they have been able to interact with the world on a physical level. And the hands are absolutely an amazing uh, piece. Uh, next, please. Um, so uh, also in the AI times, uh, a colleague from uh, uh, an AI scientist from uh, Stanford uh, basically said, you know, it's reason, it seems reasonably com simple to, to make machine algorithms that can play chess and go uh, recently. But it's very complicated to reproduce what uh, the intelligence of interaction that the little baby has. Next, please. And this is very evident if we if we see videos of nature, so humans can do, and uh, uh, and other uh, animals that you know uh, this little bird without going in the details, uh, there is no machine that that can uh, follow the performance of birds even at the current stage and the highest level of technology. Next, please. Uh, so. What, of course, uh, I think that uh, the, the, the AI is, is ground in the an algorithmic side, which is what people normally call AI, and in, in the interaction with the physical words, which is intelligent on its own. As I, say, I said, you know, the hands, the way you really interact with the physics of the world. Uh, next, please. So uh, I think that the issue is uh, uh, that and uh, for the rest, data drives everything. So uh, I think that the, the, the way the PPP, uh, why I believe that the PPP will be a very big success is because, next please, uh, it will be driven by data. As I said, data drives everything. Next. And uh, the data will then, uh, next please, uh, the data will basically feed uh, the algorithmic side of artificial intelligence and more the system side, where they said with the physical interaction with the world. Next please. And there you have that what people normally, uh, usually call the AI is, is that side, next please, twice. Uh, then you have that the robotics most the physical world. So the PPP will be the connection of these three ingredients which are fundamental uh, uh, to, to create the future of artificial intelligence for society. Now, Spark has, and now we can, uh, we can close the presentation and I can answer your question very briefly. Spark has been a, a, an excellent exercise in the last year, a successful exercise, because that's brought a lot of, uh, of uh, uh, innovation. And I think that was an example of relation with the private and public sector between EU robotics representing the, the, the private sector and the European Commission. And uh, BDVA is a similar example as it was presented. In fact, I'm very happy that uh, uh, we are collaborating to try to make this new endeavor altogether big success. Thank you very much. Thanks to you. Um, in moving forward uh, with uh, this new PPP on AI, big data and robotics, uh, um, a, big, uh, a big part, a big challenge will be uh, how to make uh, these new technologies that can have a very disruptive effect on society and work as we know that, uh, uh, on, by workers to make that acceptable by workers and by the general public. Um, Lubna, uh, what is your view on this uh, as a CEO, so coming from the private uh, sector and as a member of the high-level expert group on AI of the EC? Uh, thank you, Barbara. First of all, um, yeah, I wanted to uh, express my gratitude for the invitation to Commissioner Maria Gabriel and to the whole research and innovation team uh, to contribute to this great debate uh, around the public and the private partnerships, especially to boost the adoption and the competitiveness of Europe around AI. Um, as my co panelists already shared, if we look to the partnerships between the public and the private sector, they were first seen back in 2000 years ago, you know, when the Roman Empire started constructing uh, and managing post office networks. And uh, this has been developed in the 16th and 17th century around big infrastructure facilities such as roads and uh, railroads and later to big digital infrastructures uh, with big companies. 
So the PPP models didn't really change from 2000 years ago, but we, if we look to today, where uh, we have 2.5 quintillion bytes of data generated per day, uh, we need to invent the public-private partnerships. Uh, where governments have big ambitions to solve. Uh, we see the pandemic, uh, we see big ambitions around climate, around healthcare, and then collaborate uh, with private companies around uh, transfer of data, training and the maintenance of those AI systems. Um, so why is this the right time to reinvent these uh, public-private partnership models in the age of AI and to boost uh, the ethical adoption as well as the competitiveness in Europe? So if we look to the crisis uh, that we're currently immersed into around COVID, we don't have the luxury to miss the momentum. We should drive competitiveness by creating and adopting AI at fast pace in Europe. This is the momentum. As much as COVID-19 was a uh, catalyst for digital adoption, we did see a detrimental effect on equality and fairness and left our citizens losing trust in the system. Uh, this crisis has left entire populations failed by the system. In the UK, for instance, we saw A-level students protesting against algorithms. Uh, uh, across member states, we see the discussion about track and tracing apps and the privacy and the human rights implications. So this pandemic has been truly bad for AI, and even the world algorithm has uh, become a taboo. So why is this? Have we developed bad AI? Have we been wrong about its adoption? But I, what I really think is, uh, I believe this situation is a result of an ineffective public-private partnership. So the key elements to boost adoption of any technology is the notion of trust. And at the high-level expert group, we defined key requirements to boost the trust and to build trustworthy AI. I want to bring your attention to one key requirement. It's around fairness, to be fair with our citizens. Uh, how can we control bias? Bias control starts before training in a system, starts at the data collection stage. And as we know, uh, public organizations are the ones that collect good data and has access to that but also starts even earlier in the procurement process to what companies, uh, and, and not I'm hoping only the big companies, but also the small companies with a big ambition. But if we look to the landscape in Europe, um, we see that data is collected not for training any AI, is collected for transactional purposes. Uh, for instance, during COVID, we see the data has been collected on the measured, measured cases like uh, on each member state. And we know that the testing was not done consistently. So it merely represents a biased peak or biased numbers that we cannot use to generate evidence for our policy making or for tra training any AI. So if we, for example, as member states agreed uh, with the public and uh, private partnerships to collect data in an evidence-based way, for example, uh, taking tests, uh, randomly selected thousands of people per country, we would have been in much better position and we would have been able to uh, introduce much better corridors across countries and also boost our economies. So from an entrepreneurial perspective, uh, I would say to make uh, PP partnerships models effective and impactful, we need to focus on outcomes. We need to uh, work together as early as possible across ecosystems to define those outcomes uh, and drive them. For example, um, to give an example at Okra, we are operating at the healthcare ecosystems and we work between life science companies, the regulators and payers as public organizations. And what we see that every stakeholder are stuck in their incentive bubble. So a lot of problem is not related to the lack of technology or the lack of data, the big problem is uh, mindset. How can we shift our uh, process from incentive-driven uh, operations or partnerships to an outcome-driven uh, public partnership? And that's, for me, the main uh, change that needs to happen. Thank you. Thank you. Um, you put a big emphasis on uh, uh, acceptability of these technologies very much related to uh, fairness uh, and the issues with bias. And I would say that this is a very um, algorithmic, data-driven uh, point of view. So I would be very curious to hear the point of view of Anna Maria, 
as a, a, a the point of view of some you know someone a CEO but from uh, an embodied uh, 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 company uh, so is this really all that is about in robotics uh, for acceptability the, the lack of bias uh, how how do you you know how, how do you see the the, the uh, challenges, if any, in acceptability by workers uh, and by uh, by the general public. What are the barriers to overcome? Uh, thank you. Um, first of all, I would like to say that this is our experience here. But at, at the same time, I talk to colleagues uh, in new robotics who are doing the same thing as we are. And I can tell you that the problem right now is um, the education of the public and the companies regarding how they can use the robots. And I'm talking here mostly about service and humanoid robots because industrial robots, usually the companies know how to use them. There are software uh, that um, can uh, give you an estimate on uh, the return of investment. So it's a lot easier at this time after years of implementation to have a business case for industrial robotics. On the other hand, while uh, we are talking about humanoid and service robots, which is an increasing um, industry, um, the public is not uh, very educated. Uh, we are now addressing a public that uh, usually didn't deal with these types of robots, and it's uh, our job to create the market, first of all, because we have to explain that robots can only perform repetitive tasks. One issue that we found to be very important is the cost of the robots, and I think we are in a cycle in the way that um, robots are now rather expensive and companies are not that willing to pay that much for them, but at the same time, if the demand doesn't increase and we don't have mass production, uh, the price won't go down. So um, if I were to say uh, what the commission could do uh, with the funds in order to, to promote the exception of robots in a different industry would be to work on the deployment of robots. The more robots we'll have, the, the more the price will drop and the adoption will be greater. Uh, we talked to several companies. Um, at some point, we can explain and we can tell them what robots can do. We can also um, um, solve the challenges that they have. For example, they don't want the robot to be online so that it can be protected. We can do that. We can personalize it for them and everything. But bottom line is the price and the return of investment. And uh, my take on the, um, on the future European funds, for example, or uh, research and innovation funds is to focus mainly on, um, on economic results. I think it's very good that we have academic research and it's very good that uh, we are perform we, we develop new technologies, but we should also look at what we do after we develop this technology in, for example, Horizon projects, because most of them don't go to market. And I think that is the problem. Uh, I think we should have a more economical driven uh, funding uh, in my opinion, this is the difference between Europe and U.S. They are more, fo more focused on, uh, on market and providing uh, the type of products that will sell and working with partners that can sell them. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. So this actually opens for my, uh, it's a good opening for my next, uh, my next question. And I really would like to hear from all of you uh, what you think about this point. Um, with respect to this uh, uh, PPP, uh, we are talking about AI, robotics, big data. And behind these names, we have academic institutions. Uh, we have uh, a public uh, uh, private uh, uh, companies, and even within these main two bodies, uh, we have a lot of, uh, a lot of colors, uh, a lot of different aspects. Uh, we have small companies, we have bigger player, we have uh, more or less uh, uh, organized and varied uh, uh, research institutions. Uh, someone might see this uh, as 
diversity as a big richness uh, of uh, uh, the European landscape. Uh, this can also be seen as a fragmentation, fragmentation in research, fragmentation in uh, use cases, uh, fragmentation in approaches. Uh, what is your, uh, uh, your view on this and what could we do to make this, uh, what we have, uh, something unique and distinctive and a strength of Europe uh, and what should we avoid uh, to turn this in, into something, into a weakness? I will start from Laura. I think first we should say that, that Europe has until now, and it still is uh, uh, largely contributing to the rise and upswing of AI, uh, data and robotics technologies. Uh, we should keep this central role in shaping uh, the, the future. Uh, of course, as mentioned earlier, broad and, and fast adoption of those technologies is important, and we should really include the industry, uh, including SMEs, of course, and startups, and that's, that's crucial for, for the, the competitiveness. Uh, the public sector could also become a, a, a role model uh, for AI deployment and demonstrating that this could yield to uh, tangible benefits for citizens. So that's what probably a uh, uh, positive aspect of, of Europe. Now, of course, we should, and that's what this partnership is about, I mean, this collaboration and bring people together. So we should establish a kind of uh, large-scale research and innovation clusters or center of excellence uh, for those technologies. Uh, again, still uh, uh, respecting European values and legal standards. And, and this is one of our strengths, this uh, uh, security, privacy, uh, uh, respect by design, I will say. Uh, this will help to address the critical societal challenges. And we, are, we really have a... An, an advantage here in Europe. Uh, the acceptance has been mentioned before. This is also where we, we the success uh, depends on the success of those technology depends. So this vision, this European vision of human centric AI that together aims at the European prosperity is an important asset and we should play with that. Thank you. Stefano, fragmentation or diversity, where do we stand? Well, I, I think that uh, diversity works. I'm the only man in the in the in the group at the moment. No jokes apart. Uh, I think that what is very important is is to make this a success. It should be all uh, uh, all the partners, the key players, should understand how the value chain works. I think that you know I'm the only academics I think in in the panel, uh, and I think it's you know uh, the value chain starts from basic research up to the end users and the, the society basically, right? And in this value chain, uh, uh, academics, for example, start at the very start. And then you have SMEs, you have big enterprises, you have services and all these kind of things. And I think it is very important that if we want this to make a success, we should not uh, push things on one side or on the other. I think that the success of a PPP like this and the success of innovation in general is the old value chain. So what I'm trying to say is, you know, uh, we shouldn't push things too much to basic research. We shouldn't think push uh, things uh, push things too much on the on the end user. We should have a, a really holistic view in how we can uh, put the oil in in the value chains in order to get good research to the end user. And I think that that's something is very difficult because of course all the stakeholders have other uh, uh, goals. And uh, but this diversity is a richness. It's not a, a, a weakness. It's a richness. But we should just be uh, very aware of uh, the, the other needs and goals in order to create uh, a good uh, stream of uh, knowledge and, and innovation from the basic research to the end user. Thank you. Lubna, what is, what is your view on this point? Um, I think for every advantage, there is a disadvantage. Uh, I mean, for us, diversity in Europe, the member states, the way we are having this cultural variety also, um, it is um, definitely an advantage and it brings a lot of uh, things and a lot of benefits uh, to the citizens. And if you look to our healthcare ecosystem as, as an example, we have better, much better uh, healthcare systems than, for example, the US, which is a much less fragment, fragmented market, so more a, a kind of comprehensive 
market. So uh, what I want to say that this advantage that comes with that is the scalability. We cannot scale faster using AI. Uh, the data will be different from one place to another, and there is different requirements and different setup. That's why, as I shared in my earlier answer, the, the shift that needs hap to happen in the uh, ecosystems, in the public-private partnerships, is the shift from a a kind of incentive economy or a volume-based economy to an outcome-driven economy. So we, uh, within each ecosystem, whether we're in healthcare or in manufacturing or telecom, we define clear outcomes for what is our vision, where we need to be, and work together as uh, stakeholders to achieve that. Then having clear roles for academia, having clear roles for public organizations, for regulators, for payers, and for uh, industry, um, and then working together to solve that big challenge. I think that is the way uh, we need to approach those collaboration and less more like this is your incentive as a payer, you need to reduce the price or you need to pay the least for new um, uh, treatments, for example, or as a um, regulators, you need to make sure every technology is kind of within a squared framework. So I think approaching it less from a, 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 a kind of tunnel vision way of doing things as without incentives to a more a holistic collaborative way to drive uh, the collaboration. Um, so, and to give you an example, uh, at Okra we built this software that interface the communication between two stakeholders, like the life science company and the payer, or life science company and the healthcare organization. And what we see really that a lot of uh, the problems is that things are lost in translation. So patients, they really don't understand that there is, for example, a vaccine of COVID later, hopefully, and they cannot get it at their local hospital. They don't understand that. Payers, uh, they don't uh, understand why they need to um, uh, accept a radical uh, a kind of incremental innovation drug that is not radically changing uh, the treatment for patients. And doctors, they, they, they also the same thing, you know, how can we uh, keep uh, coping with this new information? So everyone is a little bit stuck in their own uh, tunnel. So um, the way we need to collaborate, uh, if we all around, for example, each ecosystem, we have this con continuous discussion uh, around how we uh, improve uh, treatments for, for example, uh, cardiovascular diseases. Uh, what is the standards? Uh, we already have some some uh, some uh, kind of frameworks for that, but I think we need to do that much more and also move away from the incentives that we um, that we have today. And people are a little bit stuck on that. Thank you. Ana Maria, this fragmentation or diversity, and here I really ask you this question from the point of view of a CEO of a, uh, of a company. So uh, thinking of all the possible actions and the whole spectrum of uh, use cases uh, and business models uh, that different companies in different European countries uh, playing in different fields uh, face. Uh, what is your view? Is it a strength? Is it a weakness? What should be done to to make it uh, a real, real strength? I am a strong believer in diversity, and I think everyone can bring something to the table. And what I learned in New Robotics, and I'm very glad that I joined this network, is the fact that you can understand better if you see the, um, the big picture. Uh, we don't normally work with academics. We started to, but it's very useful to see uh, the insights of the other side of the of the table. Let's say uh, it's very important to to see what others are doing, although it's not in a field that you are necessarily working in, because sometimes innovation comes from joining two different uh, fields of work. And I think it's very useful for us as persons to have a holistic view and to understand what others are doing and see how you can integrate that in your work. I think this is what is um, usually me missing, um, not only in our companies, but in uh, companies that might become our clients, 
the fact that we are all focused on what we are doing and do not see what's going on around us. I think diversity can be the, the drive to this partnership. Thank you. So um, another quick round and then we'll go for, uh, for the closing. Uh, what do you foresee as the role of excellence in the PPP and what type of, uh, uh, of actions, what type of initiatives do you think would be most appropriate uh, in, uh, uh, to support excellence uh, in this field? Laura. I think we can uh, leverage what we did until today. I mean, this the current uh, uh, Horizon 2020 partnership, the Big Data Value Association, EU Robotics, uh, already achieved this high impact and, and cohesion and engagement uh, within the, the, the respective communities, data and robotics. Uh, we also collaborate for more than two years uh, on building this new partnership and expand to the broader community, so including your AI, Elise, uh, Claire, uh, uh, in this uh, setting up. So I think, uh, I mean, openness and inclusiveness uh, uh, have been mentioned before, but this is definitely the guiding principle for a successful partnership. Uh, uh, we need to, to do this cross-domain uh, uh, to, to get this uh, different knowledge from different angles uh, to fulfill the vision. Of course, we will include the existing partners, but we also should reach uh, new partners, new businesses, experts, knowledge, entrepreneurs, etc. Uh, what is important is really the, the, the a well-balanced membership, but uh, geographically, of course, uh, covering the different topics uh, uh, in those technologies, AI, data, and robotics. Uh, and again, building a community between academia, research, industry, uh, when I say industry, I mean startups, SME, large industry. So that's this is key. This uh, this uh, collaboration and those different uh, uh, angle competences, uh, knowledge, etc. So of course the leading principle still should be uh, producing valuable content in Europe for Europe and to overcome those uh, particular interests to trust each other. Uh, I think those joint strategy is really leveraging the European strength. And, and this is a unique selling point that we could be developing uh, with a strong focus on, on, on new businesses and new technologies. Thank you. Stefano, the role of excellence uh, in all of this. I think, uh, yes, I think that uh, the answer is uh, uh, keep up and, and continue the European way of doing things. Uh, I mean, it is a fact that, you know, the, the Americans and people with a very high capital way they are buying and trying to get people of quality of talent outside Europe. So, and that will be hard to compete on that. But what we can compete in Europe definitely is by uh, pushing intrinsic motivation. I, I don't know if you know the, the wonderful book of Dave Pink on uh, called Drive that uh, talks about it. And what I'm trying to say is to, to you know, to help to, to motivate the people and the talents to stay in Europe and to contribute to European uh, growth. And that is done, uh, I think, very simply by creating an environment, a methodology, uh, look at diversity, as was mentioned before, and infrastructure. So to, 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 to create those boundaries conditions in which talent will actually be pleased to stay in Europe, even if possibly, financially speaking, you know, the retribution will not be as high as uh, going to play uh, to, to work for, you know, the Google of our times. And, and if we manage to do like this, as once again, the, the, the book of Dave Pink uh, uh, shows that on, based on study and science, that, you know, the quality and the talent will rise much better than pushed by motivation than by money. Lobna, what is your view on that? What is going to be the, uh, the role of excellence uh, in all of this? Uh, um. I think uh, the the role of excellence and also within the context of the public-private partnerships, I think uh, really uh, moving away and um, defining very clear outcomes uh, for, for the different ecosystems, setting up collaborations and diverse set of stakeholders from public and private organizations 
and um, defining very, very clear outcomes, for example, uh, reducing the rate of uh, heart, uh, heart failures in Europe by X or reducing the CO2 emissions by X and very clear outcomes for, uh, for our uh, uh, continent. And then we say, well, how uh, can we set those stakeholders together to achieve that? And in this way, uh, we are almost shifting the incentives that everyone is stuck into how we can achieve that outcome together. And instead of debating, we will be discussing and we will be defining the roles, how we can contribute. And um, I do believe uh, we have a good advantage in Europe. We have strong ecosystems. We already, uh, uh, the only thing that we need to shift, they, they used to fight each other or to at least, you know, find the, to challenge each other, which is not bad, but maybe find now a way to work together as an ecosystem and defining clear challenges for that. And it starts as early as uh, the procurement process. I don't see it as one way. I see it as both ways instead of saying, public organizations need to choose or to pick who, I would say, who is the best stakeholders to achieve challenge X? Uh, and to approach it more from that perspective rather than, you know, we are the public sector, who is going to be the best to work with? So I think really uh, being humble enough to move from that uh, seat and to uh, focus on meeting those challenges. Uh, I also think, um, as Stefano mentioned, we need to stick to our values. In Europe, we have that societal focus uh, and we should definitely stick to that. I do believe, however, we should learn from other uh, countries like US and China. Um, I, if, if I look as a machine learning expert, if I look to the big uh, barrier for scale in Europe, uh, of course, there is the data fragmentation, which is one, but uh, mindset is another one. Uh, we are stuck into an analytical rule-based mindset. Processes that we need to follow, some of it is bureaucracy, some of it is the way we want to do things in a compliant way, uh, which is not agile and which is, uh, delays the way we think. So I think one learning or maybe the way we, we can uh, learn from other countries so how can we move faster? Still keep the values as uh, 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 important, that set the outcomes, but don't, don't define the details, you know? Let's agree on the vision, but let the freedom for each stakeholder, give them the, the, the boundaries, like around, for example, the ethics or around uh, compliance, and let them uh, be challenged and produce the best they, they can. Uh, I think allowing for that flexibility is very important to move faster. Uh, and uh, uh, so, so, yeah, and I think we, we can really achieve in a short amount of time uh, by breaking a big problem into smaller pieces and allowing for sandboxes to test and experiment uh, much faster, we, we, will, uh, we will be able to, to change the world. Thank you. Ana Maria, we are in the last 10 minutes. Uh, so your view on the importance and the role of excellence uh, in the upcoming PPP. Well, I think we should encourage excellence from all areas. And uh, from my point of view, Horizon, as it is right now, it's not encouraging that. Uh, mostly it favors incumbent companies or institutions. In order to get a Horizon project, you need to be big enough to be there. Um, if we look at innovation, some of the some of them come from um, a garage, like you know Microsoft and Google. And the idea is, how can you help this type of innovation to start? Because as it is right now, um, the the partnership and the funds that uh, Horizon gave so far is not encouraging that. Uh, from my point of view, the SME instrument was very good, but it refers to uh, uh, to projects that are TRL six or seven or higher, and that uh, from that point can go to market. And otherwise, it's only the digital innovation hubs that uh, favor experiments. But if you look at all the innovation hubs, it's mostly uh, companies that are already well established that win this project and that know to know how to write the proposal. And I think um, we should introduce something new in uh, in this type of funding uh, for smaller 
um, enterprises or for initiatives that might have that idea uh, that could bring something new to Europe. I totally agree that Europe has the advantage over China and US um, with the values that we promote and I strongly believe in them. But at the same time, we should look at how things go and that innovation might come from some place that we don't expect and we shouldn't wait to see whether they survive or not. And I'm gonna very quickly give you an example of uh, UiPath, which is uh, one of the largest RPA companies uh, in the world right now, um, which started in Romania. But uh, for six years, uh, those guys were working in an apartment because they couldn't get any a, any funding to, to get their project started. And guess what? The U.S. Uh, funded them like crazy. They became uh, Decacorn right now. And uh, now they are not a European company. They are a U.S. company. This is how everyone presents it. So uh, we missed that opportunity, if you ask me. And it's very possible that we miss it in the future also because we are not looking um, also in other places. I'm not saying that... Um, What's happening now, it's wrong, but I think we should also uh, put something like this uh, for initiative. It's very hard, for example, to, to make a robot if you don't have the infrastructure. It's not like making an app. You need like 50,000, 100,000 euro just to build a prototype to show it to the clients or to, to make a case for it. It's very difficult to start in a garage without uh, any funding to innovate in the field of robotics. Although I'm, although I'm very sure there are many students who might come up with very good ideas. Thank you. So one thing that we need to remember for uh, the next PPP, we need to go and nurture the talents in Europe from the very early beginning. We cannot uh, wait to see if they sink or swim because then it's too late. Uh, Laura, as uh, um, a big a key player in the PPP on uh, big data value, what is, we have three minutes, uh, one lesson learned uh, from the past uh, and something that we have to bring and keep in mind for the future? Uh, again, as mentioned earlier, openness, uh, inclusiveness, collaboration uh, and cooperation. This, this was really a uh, uh, it makes it successful. And today we are releasing uh, this strategic research, innovation and deployment agenda, which is a joint work of those uh, uh, five. So BDVA, EU, EU Robotics, Elix, Pure, AI and Claire. So those uh, five associations collaborated and produced this uh, 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 um, yeah, this new agenda. And it includes a free specific deep dive section. And that's really... Uh, it, it's a common work, and this is really uh, important to federate together. Uh, and we hope uh, this partnership, this type of collaboration, and will really federate the different com communities that are uh, forming this European AI data and robotics. And of course, ultimately, the idea is really to stimulate uh, uh, public and private investment and, and uh, address those key challenges. So hopefully, I think we did a good job until today. So we just uh, we continue uh, in a bigger scale. It's a meta uh, partnership, I would say, but that's uh, really uh, uh, the, this collaboration is key for, to deliver this uh, this uh, vision in Europe. So uh, nurturing a new talents uh, from the early beginning, uh, uh, collaboration going beyond the limits of the uh, uh, and. Uh, the mindset of our own communities uh, and coming together with uh, uh, for a stronger vision uh, that uh, uh, can really push forward the uh, uh, the agenda. We are at the end of our panel. I would like to thank you all for the very stimulating and interesting uh, interesting discussion. And thanks for uh, all of you who has been listening to us. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you.